You are tired of average. You want more out of life. You know you're capable of something greater. This show will help you become resilient in your home, at work, and in your community. Welcome to the Resilient Humans Podcast with your host, Kevin Wood. Welcome back to the Resilient Humans Podcast and super guest today, a former principal left education a few years ago to pursue his current purpose, which is helping to build young men. And what a great opportunity to discuss resiliency and building young men at the same time. Um, he's got a great backstory and a ton of knowledge, and we're hoping that this is going to resonate with some parents and coaches out there. So welcome to the show, Dennis Meralda. Kevin, thank you, my man. Super guest. I've never been called a super guest before. It's next level. Dude. Thank <laughs> you. I really appreciate it. We got special guests, super yeah, guests, super guests, wow, remarkable guests. It's all good. <laughs> so yeah, you you have your own podcast. Is that correct? I do. It's a uh, same name. Building Men is the name of the podcast. It started about three and a half years ago. July first of twenty twenty was the first episode. Awesome. Oh, so like right in the middle of COVID. Why not? It was one of the things that like that 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 could be part of the backstory. Uh, it was ready, fire, aim. I I was lost and <laughs> floundering in my own life, a total disaster. And that was a thing that I, that helped pick me back up out of a difficult situation was starting the building men podcast, ready, fire, aim. Let's go. Yeah. So give us a little bit of a backstory. Um, like you said, you were a former principal in left education. Uh, I was kind of in the same boat as you. I was a teacher for five years and then left that and started a, a gym and now helping build resilient humans. So um, tell us a little bit about your story. So the the backstory for building men, and I'll take it all the way back to my own upbringing. Um, a, a central New Jersey guy. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, graduated from high school in 95. But I grew up with not really having a positive male role model in my life. I had a father who who was my biological father, who was anything but a positive male role model, very abusive physically, mentally, emotionally abusive. He was also very like the way that he perceived like how a man should be was that like toxic male ideology around like you have to be bigger faster stronger physically dominant it was more about appearance he was a hard-working guy but it was everything he did was very showy um so he wanted you know he wanted people to know how big he was how strong he was how much money he made um and it was about the stuff you know like he, that was what he believed in and so i grew up in a space where my father was also the coach of all the teams that i played on I was a really good athlete growing up, and uh, so I played football, played basketball, played baseball, and did well in all the sports with him as my coach. And, you know, it, I was growing up in a time where if I did well, say I hit two home runs in a game, or if, uh, you know, I threw a touchdown pass, scored 20 points on the basketball court, I felt like a level of acceptance, validation, love for my father. Uh, my take it at the family out for ice cream if I hit a home run. But if it was the opposite, if I wasn't successful, I walked in a run with the bases loaded. I made a big error in a game. I missed a layup. I struck out three times in a game. One, I remember, I could still remember like viscerally the feeling of being down 0-2 in the count and looking at him at the, as the third base coach, him shaking his head and me starting to already have that physiological mm. response to his disapproval of me. And then forget about it, Kevin, if I ever shed a tear during a game, I mean, I was like, first of all, like verbally blasted right there in front of everyone. But then it became a physical thing as well. Like I remember him taking my head and like throwing me into his van and like backhanding me in the car. Like I remember the the feeling of going through that. So I grew up in a space where I didn't have a male role model in a positive way. I was constantly seeking for a coach, a mentor, a teacher. And boys growing up there, you know, it's very unlikely for them to have a male teacher. You know, it's most, it's like 80% of teachers are females. And even the guy teachers, it's the gym teacher that they have once a week or the shop teacher that they have for a marking period at some point in their, in their careers. So I was constantly seeking that out and wound up, uh, you know, after high school, I did really well in sports again, but I was always searching for what does it mean to be a man? What does that actually mean in the world? And uh, after high school, I went on to play college baseball and studied education and, and had a coordinate major in sociology. I was really fascinated with the, the way social groups interacted with one another, you know, based on my experience playing sports. And that led me to an opportunity as an intern at this halfway home for at-risk boys as a college senior. So I was 21 years old 
And now I'm observing group and individual counseling sessions with these boys that were in this program because they were the victims of physical or sexual abuse, or they were neglected in their, in their family structure, or they had gotten caught up with the law. They were on the law, the wrong arm, the wrong end of the, of the criminal situation. And so they had gotten locked up and the court said, you need to be a part of this program. So now here I am, a 21-year-old kid, really struggling with my, my own identity and what it meant to be a man. And now I'm observing these sessions, and then they hire me as a van driver. So now I'm driving around some really tough areas in South Jersey, picking boys up from school, driving them back to go through these counseling sessions, and then driving them home at night at like 10, 11 o'clock. And what happened was the more trust I built with these kids, all of a sudden they start to talk to me, this you know idiot 21-year-old about stuff that they weren't opening up to doctors of psychology and social workers about. And then all of a sudden they started to ask me to take the long way home. So we are like little group, you know, uh, whack pack could have a, a conversation about the stuff that they really wanted to talk about. And then they're like, can I be the last one that gets dropped off? So you can have some time so I can share my stuff with you. And what I started to see were a couple like uh, common themes with these boys. They really didn't feel like they had an opportunity to, to, to talk and be themselves. And this group was interesting because they were coming from different schools. So they didn't have to worry about going into school the next day and get their balls busted because they mm. cried about something or because they opened up about their family dynamics. And what I started to do was just share my own story with them. And they, they connected in a lot of ways. So after graduating from college, I taught for a very short period of time. I taught for five years uh, got my master's in educational leadership. And it's interesting that my third day teaching was September 11th of 2001, teaching in Central New Jersey, where I could see the smoke from the World Trade Center from my classroom. So I was in a space where I also recognized the importance of creating a safe community for, for kids to come in. And it was so much more about the connection over the curriculum and kids need to be known. So it was more about like knowing the kids we teach more and more than knowing the content that we were teaching. And I decided that was going to be the basis of my philosophy in education. And then I, after my master's degree, I got a job as, as an administrator, as an assistant principal in central New Jersey in 2005 and started um, as a school leader, recognizing all the shit I was dealing with was with the boys in the school. You know, all the, the fights, the suspensions, the disrespectful behaviors, kids coming to school late, getting to, you know, getting tossed out of class, failing grades. It was all the boys. And so what I decided to do was I started a boys group and I called it building men. And this boys group, what I wanted to do was just have a safe space for the boys to talk about the real stuff. And I told them what's said here stays here, but we're going to like live by some things. But first I need to know young men, like, what do you think it means to be a man in the world? Talk to me, build me a man. And so what they told me were, it was like things that like went back to my own upbringing things that I saw my father believe in wholeheartedly was like, you need to be physically dominant and you need to be the toughest guy. You need to be able to beat people up. You have to be able to bench a certain amount and you have to have the abs and things like that. So it was like physical dominance. And then it was how many girls can you bang or how hot are the girls that you're having sex with? So it was sexual conquest. And it was like the wealth, the accumulation of the stuff meant that you were a better man. So these ideologies of what they thought it meant to be a man, I was like, they can all potentially be taken away from you. What if you base your manhood on your head and your heart and things that are intrinsic and based on your character, your integrity could be accountability, uh, authenticity, leadership, humility, confidence, courage, self-discipline or and or service to other people. What if you base your, your manhood or masculinity around those things? And I started to see some magical things happen. The boys started to open up and talk and lean into conversations. And in one year of running that program, the suspension rate in my school dropped 75%. So I saw like when, when I had the boys getting together and talking, magical things were happening. And it became something I decided to dedicate my life to in some way, shape or form. I wasn't really sure what that would look like. It went through several iterations and some, some peaks and some really, really low valleys over the next you know 15 or to 20 years or so. But it led me to what I'm doing right now is, is trying to build young men to lead, to serve, and to change the world. Sounds, as you were talking about that, I was going through the, my memory loop of the, the boys that I taught. And it was the same situation. Like I had, a, I had one, one boy, he was in grade nine, nose to nose with me, ready to knock me out. I'm like, it's your choice, man. You can do this. But you know what's going to happen afterwards. No girls ever would ever do that. And it seems like when those, when those boys that you were working with had the opportunity 
to release. It seems like it's a release that then they didn't have to take it out on others or, you know, those misbehaviors that we'll typically see. So it's a way of them just getting that off their chest or get it, get it literally getting the weight of the world off of them so that they can actually be men and vulnerable. And that's okay. Totally agree with that. And I talk to the boys all the time about there's tremendous strength in being vulnerable. Right. And, and what does that look like? And I think as, as parents, one thing that we do, and I have three kids of my own, I have a son who's 18 years old, a daughter who's 16 and a daughter who's 13. I think as parents, what we do initially is like, we need to tell the kids the stories of the time that we hit the game winning jump shot and the time that, you know, we hit the home run and the, we, the crowd cheered our names, but th that's happening one in 10 times. The other nine times where we struck out, we made the error, we missed the layup, we fumbled the, the snap. And it's okay to talk to our kids about those things as well. Like there were times that we gave it a shot and we failed, but like going into the name of your podcast, like what, what did you do? What did you have in you to help you overcome that stumbling block? So kids need to hear those vulnerable stories from their dads, especially that when the things didn't go their way, they didn't tuck tail and run away from the situation. Like, you know what? That was really hard, but I'm stronger than that was hard. And I could do something to overcome. And now I, what can I do to teach my own kids about situations like that? I, I have a daughter as well. She's nine. And part of my, well, it's parenting. Part of my parenting is exposing her to do hard things so that when things come up in her life that are challenging, she'll have that memory bank. She hasn't, I don't see it. It may, it may happen at school and she doesn't tell me about it, but it is my hope that she is able to look back on those hard things that she's done before and come out on the other side of it fairly unscathed. I love that, Kevin. And, and I'll tell you what, too, a great parenting strategy that you're using right there. I've really geeked out on neurobiology. I'm a huge now, like Dr. Andrew Huberman fan, Huberman Lab, love that guy. And I've done a lot of research around what you're saying, you know, like talking to your kids about doing the hard things. And actually when you're telling your kids, this is going to be hard. Like what, what is in front of you is, is going to be hard. And they realize it's going to be hard. And when they see whatever task that is through to fruition, it develops a neural pathway in their brain. It's like laying down train tracks between the starting point and the ending point, which is hard for them to get to. But once they do that, the next time that something comes up that they perceive as being challenging or difficult, they're more likely to be able to complete that test. If it, if it takes them 20 minutes or 20 days, help them see that through. Because what happens conversely is if you, they start a task that they perceive as being hard and they give up or they don't want to do it anymore, or we as parents let them off the hook, now it develops this like, divide in the train tracks and the next thing that comes up that's hard for them they're more likely to give up on that task so as parents it's not easy to, to help you know like you got to see this through to the end it's more work on us but it's going to help them in their future i see, yeah i see that often well parents will coddle and let them off the hook you're not doing your children any favors at all by doing that um just this morning, we had uh, an issue getting to school. She has some some anxiety when it comes to going to school. So I said, you get one hour and then we're going. Like, that's it. You're not spending the whole day at home. This is not how this works. You go one hour, get your stuff together, and then we're going. Okay. And then that was it. But if I said, oh, yeah, no, you're fine. Just stay at home. We'll We'll hang out. What's, what's that telling her that it's okay to just, eh, I don't feel like doing something today. I don't need to do it. No, no, you school is your job. <laughs> You're going to it, whether you want to or not have your little one hour pity party. And then we're good to go. And, and it was a, fine. As a dropped her off was, and it was great. And credit to you for doing that. That's hard to do, you know, to look at your little girl and say, Oh yeah. You, but the, definitely the right thing to do is one of the, most common conversations I had with parents is well, you need to let your kid go through that challenging situation. Like let your kid experience difficulty, let your kid fall down and understand how determined they are, how resilient, how perseverant they are to overcome those things. 
we need to stop as parents solving the problems for the kids. Right. And the other thing we need to do as parents, too, is delay gratification and, and teach kids the importance of delayed gratification. You know, like if you're going to get the dessert, you got to finish the string beans. You know, if you're going to you have a sleepover, you have to get all your chores done before the, the, the sleepover happens, whatever it is, insert whatever thing it is. But they need to understand they need to go through the suck, like like teaching kids at a young age about intentional discomfort. We're we're in the generation of parents where it's like everything is immediate gratification. Everything is so comfortable. Kids need to go through a little bit of that, that toughness that to, to develop a level of resiliency. It's not they're not born with it. They need to learn that. And what they learn it through is by the parents going through it themselves. So you can take your kids as far as you have gone yourself. So if you're sitting on the couch, cracking open a six pack every single night, watching Netflix and watching seven football games on Saturday and telling your kids, you need to get outside. They're like, look at you, dad. Yep. You're sitting on the couch getting fat, right? So like as parents, the lessons are caught and not taught. So you need to step in that space first for your kids to follow along. That hits home. I just posted that last night. Um, I didn't get a chance to get into the the gym yesterday for a class. So I cranked the heater on in the garage and I asked my daughter if she wanted to come out and work out with me. And so we grabbed, we have a little training bar for it's 10 kilo bar and I would do my set and then I'd come over to her and she'd do her set and that's it. She, she loved it. She loved it. At the end, I was like, we got to get a, a selfie with our, our big muscles now. Yeah. She, you know, it's, it's allowing her to, it's showing her that excuses, you, you have results or excuses. You you can pick one or the other, right? And if she wants to get better at things, she's got to put in the work, but I have to be the model. I could have easily sat on the couch and scrolled and whatever, but it was like, no, you're going to come out with me. We're going to do this together. And what a, what a great bonding experience. Like she absolutely loved it. And she's actually getting like good at it. So it's really, it's really fun to see. Love that. Um, Give me some, uh, give me some examples here of lessons that young men need. Now we kind of talked about this already. Like they need to see these examples and, and, and be vulnerable and open. Um, What are some things that you see as kind of like pillars for, for young men to know? Well, I, uh, what I do is I base building men around 12 character pillars and then 12 healthy habits. So I, I do like one per month of each of them. And those things that are happening when I'm in a school doing building men or I'm facilitating an online group or an individual coaching, I always need to see men having conversations as well. I think it's, it's a big rite of passage instead of just them saying one part, like having men have conversations and, and watching men go through things together and them being observant of those situations. But the character pillars that I believe in for young men, it's accountability, authenticity, commitment, confidence, courage, humility, integrity, leadership, respect, resilience, um, and self-discipline. And those are the ones that I, like every character pillar, like once a month, I'll talk about that in depth. And then there's little rites of passage. So for accountability, I talk to the boys and what I'll, I'll do is I share the, the, the stuff that I've gone through in my own life. So I'll share a situation where I needed to take full accountability for something, something that I had lied about in the past when I was younger and swept it under the carpet and blamed other people. And so I'll give an example of something that I have recently taken full accountability for. And I put the challenge out there to them. Take accountability for something in your life. There's a the guy who coached the uh, New York Jets back in the day and then the Chiefs afterwards. His name is Herm Edwards. I think he still does Sunday Night America or something like that. Uh, football coach. He has the quote, what is done in darkness will always come to light. And so I talked to the boys about that. I'm like, take this opportunity to own something that you've done in your past and, and talk about it. It's really hard to do. And kids talk about why well, I stole 20 bucks from my mom. And I told, you know, or like a kid went to church and his mom gave him 10 bucks to put in the offering thing. And he took it and went and got three snapples and a monster beverage. And then he told his mom about it. So I'm like, how does that feel to go through and take an accountability? That's one thing, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, self-discipline, let's talk about some things that you can put into place. And so I have these daily habits that I talk to the boys about. And what I tell them is if you, if you take these daily habits, and I'm sure they're the same thing that you're talking to people about, but kids aren't hearing it when they're 
13, 14, 15 years old. And so we talk about the importance of getting enough sleep, eight to nine hours of sleep every night, the importance of, of getting at least half of your body weight plus about 20 ounces in water a day and cutting out, you know, monsters and rains and sodas and, and that kind of crap. We talk about getting outside and getting sunlight on our body and moving and, and the importance of breath work, the importance of gratitude, of journaling, the importance of strength training, the importance of putting yourself in intentionally uncomfortable situations. So all of those things, if the kids are doing this for the course of a year and learning these really healthy habits, plus having conversations with adult male role models about accountability and authenticity and integrity, like that's a big deal for kids to go through it. I didn't have that. And what I'm trying to do is like fill the void of things that I know that I needed, that I needed to figure out a way to supplement through different conversations and reading about things and watching them. What can I do to provide a space for boys to learn this in a real way with other boys going through the same thing at the same time? Have you noticed a change over the years? I know when I was in education, over that five years, I noticed quite a difference from my first year to my last year. I can't imagine I've been in the school system in years, but what it would be like now, geez, almost, almost 20 years later. Um, have you noticed a shift in, in young men, their behavior, their thought patterns, their mindset? Well, one thing without a doubt, I mean, the incorporation of, or the accessibility to anything they want to see at any time in the entire world ever is right at their fingertips, right? You know, the, you hear the thing about a 13 year old boy right now has the ability to look at more naked women in like one hour than like the richest King in the history of the world could in his entire life, 500 years ago. Right. So there's this immediate gratification thing that's going on with boys. I think right now and the conversations that I'm having boys in schools feel like they have to apologize for being born with a penis. Mm. It's like, I am so sorry that I've uh, had this affront on the entire world that I was born with you know, male genitalia. That is a bad thing. Like they, they believe this. Uh, so that's another thing that they're fighting against right now. So a couple of things that I'll throw out to you, a couple of stats. I have a ton of stats, like 41% of boys. This is stats in UK. I, I read this post. There's a guy, uh, his Instagram, Instagram handle is the tin men. Um, I just interviewed him on the building men podcast right before we got on and that episode will publish in a, in a month or so. But one thing that he talks about is in the UK, 41% of boys ages 12 through 16 are taught that boys are currently a huge problem in society, that they're hearing about this in school. And 27% of middle school boys in the UK have been told about toxic masculinity. One quarter of boys are that. hearing that, like yeah. they're hearing that, they're hearing about toxic ma masculinity. And this is, it's definitely like not, um, you know, I, I get a lot of pushback for this, but I don't believe that that is a thing. Well, I believe that there is toxic male ideology. I believe there are, there are toxic traits that men have, that some men have, but I don't think that there is such a thing as toxic masculinity. I think like masculinity is, it should be viewed as a positive thing, right? That's masculinity. There are toxic male traits, 100%. Like there are toxic things that men do. There are toxic things that females do, but I think boys are now thinking that they need to apologize for being born a male. And it's like, one of the things that I'm doing in school is like, it's okay. Like, let's, let's talk about like trends that are going on in society and things that you can do to overcome those stereotypical things that you're hearing from other people in the world. Yeah. I was going to ask, that was a specific question I had is that, that toxic mask, where did that even come from? Like somebody, yeah. somebody came up with that term and it lit, it lit up. And it feels like it, it overtook the media like a wildfire. I don't hear about it so much now because we're the media cycle so fast. It's kind of moved on, but it's still there and it lingers and it's got to, it's got to linger in those kids' heads as well. hundred percent. And, and the thing is like boys are struggling as compared to girls in school as a school principal. Um, what you get the statistics of different things that are going on in school. And there are these subgroups of it might be like racial subgroups. And so if you're, if one subgroup is doing better or worse than another, you need to look at, well, why is that the case? And it might be special education. So these, these students are classified at a higher rate as compared to others. And one subgroup that doesn't exist is boys. But boys, when you look at boys versus girls, they're doing way worse in school right now. And I'll give you a quick example. So I grew up in the 80s and 90s, right? And, and in schools at the time, 
boys did better than girls historically in science and math. So there are, you know, results on standardized test scores and AP exams and placement tests and what have you. Boys were doing better than girls in science and math. So what did we do? We said, what's going on in the schools that this is the case? What's wrong with the schools? And we, de we developed a lot of programs to incorporate more uh, girls being involved with STEM programs and math and in science. So we're like, what's wrong with the schools? Let's bring in and try to help the girls. Well, the pendulum swung all, all the way in the other direction. We're right now in schools. Boys are doing worse across the board in every single like substantial um, area in school other than physical education and shop class. Girls are outperforming boys like by big margins in those areas. And right now in schools, girls are where it was. Boys were more likely to become the, the school valedictorian or salutatorian. It was like two thirds boys to a third girls. Then, you know, it leveled out to where it was about 50-50. Now, 70% of school valedictorians are females. And not only that, 66% of the kids that are classified into special education are boys. 70% of kids that are arrested that are school age, under the age of 18, are boys. 70%. 70% of kids suspended from school are boys. Um, kids that are placed in juvenile facilities, 95% of kids in juvenile facilities are boys. But what's happening now is when we look at those stats, boys are doing worse. They're performing worse. They're getting in trouble. All these things we're saying, not what's wrong with the school. We're saying what's wrong with the boys. And that's a huge problem. I'm like, let's call it out. Like the emperor's like new clothes. Like let's look at it and say, what's going on in the schools that we are not identifying that the boys are struggling, not only schools. And then they, and then they get out of schools. Boys are struggling when compared to, to girls in the world. What are we doing to address the situation? We're saying, boys, you're wrong. You should apologize for being born with a penis. And that's a huge problem. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's people like you that are giving them a chance. So kudos to you for, for creating this because it's, it's needed. It's, you can see it. I see it. You obviously see it. Um, and it's great that you're, you're, you're there to <clears throat> support and highlight this, that it is an issue and that there are things that can be done about it. I do see it as, you know, the state of the public education system. It needs to change. We're, we're putting these students into like rows and, and lines and that's not life. Life doesn't go in, in straight patterns and we have to allow that to to change and evolve because our world has changed and evolved. It's not it's not the same as it was when the public education system was first created. I know the teachers around here are very frustrated with the lack of support and and systems that they just don't have access to. Um, they feel like they're they're kind of like swimming without a, a life jacket, and it's tough. And a lot of good teachers are leaving the profession because of the lack of support that they're not getting it's it's got to be it's it's got to come from the top usually it's a ground root like it starts from the bottom but i really think that this has to come from the top and it's not going to change until enough people make a stink about it and schools while you know there have been like the pendulum swings back and forth between more accountability and more mental health kind of things going on in schools Schools haven't changed all that much, except for like the incorporation of technology into schools. Mm. They haven't changed that much in the last hundred plus years. You know, you, you could potentially go into a school then, and I do work in schools and I see what's going on and schools are not set up for boys to be successful, right? Boys, they, they're they developmental, developmentally delayed when compared to girls, especially mentally and socially. Like they're, it they takes them a little bit longer. Puberty hits at a later rate for boys than it does for girls. Boys are, you know, they need a little bit more activity in classrooms, but what are they told? They're told to sit to down quietly in the yep. hallway. Shh, we need to be super quiet before we go to the next class. They're, they're, they're put in rows. They're told to raise their hand. They're, they're told to, you know, so we're, we're basically like, like stifling a lot of what happens and school is, you know, it's become this like standard you know, standardization of, of education. And it's one of the reasons I left public education was one. I was told in a school district, like, no more of this group stuff. You need to raise our test scores. Our test scores need to, like, raise as compared to our local school districts. 
um, and no more of this touchy feely boy stuff. We're not doing that anymore. And I'm like, this is the real stuff. Like you want to, you want to change a kid's life. Talk to him about the like self-discipline because if a kid can learn self-discipline, talk to him about like presenting themselves publicly, talk to them, talk to the kids about financial literacy, about how a group works, how to be assertive without being a douchebag, right? Like how to, how to, how do you communicate your point? How do you, how do you speak publicly in a situation and command uh, a space that's not taught in school? You might get a little sprinkling of it here and there, but they're, they're taught to memorize every Spanish speaking country and the capital of that country. They're taught the solar system five freaking times in different grade levels in schools. That's that stuff they can Google. They can figure that stuff out. What are the kids learning like the real stuff? They're not. And that's a huge problem. Schools say drugs are bad. But if you can't sit still for eight hours, here's some drugs to make here's sure some that you do. Here's some. Yep. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, before we started uh, recording, you mentioned uh, the three thieves. I would love for you to kind of discuss those uh, each and and kind of go over and why why they're so mischievous or thieving. <laughs> yeah. So the three thieves are, and I like I tried to with the boys. I have the boys talk about them. This is usually like the second or third meeting that I have in a school with boys. Um, the first is resistance. And resistance, like I look at resistance as like this like hulking figure in front of you that's like you think it's too hard to overcome. And he has a partner, and that's that little devil that sits on your shoulder and is whispering. It's like the Billy story, the little devil that's telling you why you're not good enough, why you can't do whatever. It's too hard. And you're not able to do it. So resistance is this figure where you're not able to do it. So that's one of the big things that gets in the way for young men is resistance. They're not, they think about whatever the challenges in front of them is too hard. Um, the second is distraction and distraction is like, I, I picture distraction as like, like a, like a beautiful figure from far away, but the closer you get, it looks more like Medusa. You know, like I, so I try to like have the boys visualize what distraction actually is. And then as you're standing there looking at Medusa, you're standing in a, in quicksand and it's just sucking you in. One of the things I have the boys do is we talked a little bit about technology and how like readily available all those things are. Um, and this is, I was in a high school in uh, North Jersey two days ago, working with boys that are, were sophomores and juniors in high school. And I asked them about their, their cell phone usage. And I said, how long do you think you spend on average a day on your cell phone? And one boy was like about 30 minutes and this kid next to him was like, bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> and it called them right out there. And, um, and so they, they, their guess was an average of three and a half hours a day that they spend on their phone. And so I was like, all right, now let's look at it. So the, it the average was three and a half hours, but the actual amount of time that the boys were spending on their phone was around eight and a half hours a day on their phone. I was going to say, they're awake. Yeah. yeah. If they're awake for 17 hours a day, 16 hours a day, they're spending more than half of that time that they are awake on their phone. And they had all these different excuses why it was so much. And I was like, well, here's the thing. You become so addicted to it that your phone has become an extension of self. Like if right now, if your pass, if you put in your password and I took your phone from you, it would be like me putting my nose against your ear or your face. Like that's how, how intrusive it would feel that you're away from your phone at this amount of time. And I challenged them. One challenge that I gave to the boys was tomorrow morning, when you set your alarm, put it on the other side of the room and just turn the alarm, like get up out of bed, turn the alarm off and do what you have to do without having your phone. And I told the boys, they think it's hysterical because I talked to them about the real stuff. I'm like, it is possible for you to not have your phone when you take a shit. I'm like, you can absolutely get in there. Like they think it's hysterical, but I'm like, first of all, you know, like sit in the space with your thoughts for a second, like go through this biological act of taking a poop without having your phone in front of you. And let your thoughts wander a little bit. And that's a good thing. And so then I talked to him. I, so I challenged him for the first hour of the day, don't go on your phone. And then I, like, I asked them if they're going to take on the challenge. And some of them do, some of them don't. And then they're going to come back to me and tell me, were they able to do that? Were they able to spend the first hour of the day without the phone? So distraction is the second thief that gets in their way. And the third is victimhood. It's blaming everyone else for all of your problems. It's your, it's your dad. It's the coach. It's the teacher. So for me, my dad was an asshole to me as I was growing up. He was not a good person to me as I was growing up. He was not a good role model. Was the abuse that I experienced my fault? No, it wasn't. But it's my responsibility to deal with all of that. And now I take it to the next level. Using my mess as my message, it's my privilege 
to have to you know to go through that and so victimhood to me is like looks like voldemort it is like the, the worst of the three in my opinion is blaming other people so then i talk to the kids like okay resistance distraction and victim of these are three thieves that are going to try always in your life and i'm sure the people that you're working with you would say it's the same three things those same three things you could figure out every problem that someone is having it's one of those three things that they're dealing with so what can we do at a young age help the kids see those things because once you see them like the problem named is the problem solved i start to say like when you're complaining about something it's which category is it going into because it's going into one of these three categories now there's going to be things in your life that are catastrophic that you're dealing with, like the death of a of a family member, right? It's you know, and it could fit into all three of those categories. But if that's the case, like, okay, now what? Do we like get stuck in this space where we can never overcome? Or like how do we how do we challenge ourselves to be resilient? And so we talk to the kids about like when it's when it comes to resistance, like I think when we're when we're thinking about like how do we overcome resistance, it's the idea of like being like self-disciplined and and focused and then having a larger purpose. And then how do we go about like overcoming these three thieves by character traits that we have and then the support we have from our network around us. And that's one of the other things that I'm doing with building men is providing a space for the kids to have that community, that tribe to go through these things together. I know. Have you done any enlifted work, like story work with them when it comes to that uh, victimhood? Like you said, that's of the three that's what I would agree is kind of the biggest yep. one. Um, obviously distraction is there, but I find it's not as uh, damaging uh, as, as victimhood, whereas victimhood can really, it not only affects the individual, but then every relationship that's around them, whether it's friends, family, coworkers, what have you. Um, Cause that, that victimhood really talks about your self-talk. If you're talking to yourself crappily, it's going to affect everybody else that's around you. It has to. 100%. And like we talk about the stories that we tell ourselves. I tell the boys, uh, you are not, you are not your thoughts. You are not your feelings. You are not your experiences. You are the thinker of your thoughts, the feeler of your feelings and the experiencer of your experiences. Like you need to get yourself out of those stories that you're telling yourself. Believe it or not, it's easier for me to do that with kids as the things are fresh in their mind rather than dealing with a guy who's like me, like I'm 44 years old going through and lifted. And those things are so ingrained in my identity, who I believe I am, because I, I've been telling these stories habitually to myself, for the, to myself for the last 30 years. When I could pick out the root of the weed when it's fresh, mm. it's a lot easier than when the weed go, grows into like a 20 foot tree in the backyard. So we do that. We go through the Billy story. We go through the corner man story. We play those games where like, how can I ever get over this? Right. Yeah. And we, we talk about like, how does that feel? And so the other thing that I love doing with the boys too, is talking to them about the soft talk because they're, they're using that soft talk on a regular basis. And like, after they say something, I write it down and then I'm like, okay, how does this sound? <laughs> Let's say it in a different way. Yeah. And I'll, the last thing that I'll say, Kevin, and I'll turn it back over is that, one of the, the big things with writing things down is when I feel like they're in that victimhood space, they write down whatever it is. Um, and so like, they'll, they'll talk to me about whatever it is and I'll, I'll type it out. Or I'll have them type it out in a Google doc. And it's like, well, I wasn't able to get this done because I stayed up too late the night before because my mom asked me to do the dishes and it wasn't fair because blah, 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 blah. And I have them write down this story. And so I, I have them there. And then I write, I write down another story and I'm like, um, I need, or I, I had this situation happen. Um, I didn't manage my time wisely enough. Um, I'm going to take full responsibility for what happened here in the future. This is how this is going to look. I'm going, wh whatever it is. And then I have them read both of them out and I say, okay, which one of these would a boy say? And which one would a man say? Ooh. Ah. Once I do that, and like, once they <laughs> see that, like juxtaposed, yeah. they a hundred percent get it. And now when the next time that they do that and I start writing it down, they're like, they stop themselves in their, tra in their tracks and they're like, they don't want to be seen as a boy who's saying things in a victim mentality. Now they're like, that's good. I will take full responsibility for what, what I can own of this situation. And so if there's a hundred percent of like responsibility to be owned in this situation, if you own 20% of it, then own that 20% of it, like own that piece of it, radical responsibility for that 20%. And it's a game changer. Like it's a life changer for boys to go through that. Soft talk is the gateway 
drug to the victim mentality. Yep. I've heard that a few times. It's funny. I've done the, I've done something similar with people where we do a goal setting session. So we write down their goals. I will fill in the blank, make, you know, come up with something personal, professional, relational, whatever it is. And then they read them, read them slowly, read them slowly, slowly with breath. I go, how, how do those make you feel? And they're like, really good. I say, let's take one of these. We have a soft talk sheet. <clears throat> I say, let's take some of these words and plug them in. I kind of want to lose five pounds. Maybe. How's that feel? Ugh. And they can just, the contrast between the two. So I take them from solid to soft and it hits a little different. It hits them a little harder. So they're like, oh, that doesn't feel good at all. Right. Your words make you feel something different. And when they realize that, like, oh, okay, that they kind of, you see the light bulb go off, like it clicks and they're like, okay. So then they get the, the soft talk handout. And I was like, your goal for the next seven days is to notice these words in your language, in other people's language. How does it feel when other people use that language with you? Probably not very good. Soft talk acknowledged. <laughs> Hundred percent, and we then it could go into a whole thing about reticular activating system. Yeah, and I, I I talk. That's usually the third or fourth meeting. So this week I'll be in a next week I'll be in a school in North Jersey, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about reticular activating system. And one thing I'll I'll start with talking to the boys about is, did any of you see a red car yesterday? And they'll be like, yeah, you know, I saw a red car. I'm like, well, how how many exactly did you see on the road or in your path, like passing how, exactly how many red cars did you see? And they're like, I have no idea. Yeah. And, and then I'm like, all right, what if I told you that tomorrow I'll give you for every single red car that you see, I'll give you a hundred bucks for every red car you see. Do you think you'd know exactly how many red cars you saw? A hundred. Absolutely. I would know. Why? Well, because I'm looking for it. Well, what if you decide to look for the positive things in your life? What if you decide to look for the reasons why you're going to be successful rather than all the reasons why you're not going to be successful? Do you think that the same thing might occur in your own life? So it's, it's them seeing it from a little bit of a different perspective. And that's why the lifted stuff just works. I mean, imagine if you had these things when you're in seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade, when you're, you're using soft talk, when you're blaming everyone else, when you're getting distracted by these things, right? And so if I can get to these kids before we develop a ton of these bad habits and let the the weight of the world beat down us from different things over years and years and years, I think I have a better chance when I'm getting them when they're young rather than waiting until they're my age, having to uncrumble all that stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's We say that with people that come through the gym, like if they have no experience, I'm like, that's great. Perfect. You don't have any bad habits that I have to break. Right. Because that's a lot harder to do. Yeah, I know. You've if you've studied neurology, then you know breaking down a neural pathway to rebuild it is harder than just building one from scratch. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you uh uh well, maybe the final question, but I will always ask this question to uh the guests that come on. Um, I'd like to know what your definition of resiliency is. How would you how would you describe it to people? I love it. Um, so resiliency to me is the belief in your mental, emotional, physical ability to overcome any challenge that is in your path and that overcoming that challenge, it might not be immediate. It might be like I look at the difference between you know, the sprint and the marathon and resiliency is, is both of those resiliency is being able to overcome that thing. That's immediately right in your path that you could like, all right, I need to dig down right here for one more rep. And it's also being able to run the marathon, recognizing that it might be the daily grind of every single day, doing the thing consistently to overcome the thing that's in your path. That's cool. How would you, or what piece of advice would you give to somebody to be practically more resilient. What could somebody go out and do today after listening to what you have to say? When I was a principal, we did this three day, two night camping trip. And it was, I took the whole seventh grade on this camping trip. And it was, you know, there was a survival course. I told the kids, you have to leave your cell phones at home, right? So it was like, they need to have conversations. There was survival. We did like a bonfire every night. 
Um, there was a confidence course that the kids would go through like a nature hike, this and that. But where I spent my time was at the base of the climbing wall. It was a seven seventy five foot climbing tower that was in front of them. And there were kids that were scared to death of heights. And I was as well when I was growing up. So heights were, that was, that always got in my way. But I would sit at the base of this climbing tower and the kids would get strapped into the harness and the belay system or whatever it was. And they would look at me, Mr. Merald, I can't do this. And I would say, well, I believe in you and you're stronger than you think you are. Go one step further than you thought you could go. And so they're at the base of the wall. They climb up one of the little rungs on the climbing tower. All right, I'm done. And I'm like, well, go a step further than you thought you could go. And like, I already did. I'm like, well, now you're there, but you can go a step further than that. And I'm there at the bottom, bottom of the wall coaching them. I'm being their corner, man. I'm that guy on their shoulder. That's, that's, you know, telling the positive things as well to believe in themselves. And before you know it, continuously hearing that same thing over and over again, God damn it. These kids got to the top of the 75 foot climbing tower. I wasn't letting them fail themselves in that situation. So what I believe is like, how do you develop that level of resiliency as, and even as a parent, how do you instill in your kids? I believe there's a, there's an educational theorist. His name is Lev Vygotsky, V-G-Y-O-T-S-K-Y. And his theory is the zone of proximal development. And the zone of proximal development is like, it's a Venn diagram where on in one circle is something that's too easy for kids. And the other circle is things that are way out of their reach. And in the middle of the Venn diagram is a sweet spot is something that is right beyond their grasp. And so if you're thinking about climbing to a rung of a ladder, it's like something they can't really reach it, but they have their support of you as their parent, as the teacher, as the coach. And they have to, jump to like get to the next rung so they can get there they just have to go a little bit further than they thought they could go so my long-winded way about resiliency is go a step further than you thought you can go even if it's one little baby step further than you thought you can go and by doing that you'll develop this idea of like i am capable of going a little bit further then that becomes the story that you're telling yourself about yourself as i'm the person that will go further than i thought was possible and for clarification, this doesn't always have to be a physical task that that is challenging. It could be, as you mentioned earlier, like looking at how long you spend on your cell phone and cutting it by an hour per day. Going like having a conversation with someone, getting up in front of a class, doing a speech, reading one page more than you thought you were going to. It could be anything, whatever that is. It's just a little bit further than you thought was possible. And then yeah. once once you did that, now there's a new baseline for you. And now you're the person that can go a little bit further and go a little bit further. And it, it, it's in every single aspect of life. Love it. That's awesome. Actually, I'm going to have that exact conversation with my daughter today. It's the Remembrance Day um, ceremony at her school. And she said she was nervous because she has to read this poem or something in front of the, the whole school. They're doing a, an assembly. And she said, oh, my tummy hurts. I don't feel very good. I'm like, you'll be fine. You've done it before and you can do it again. And so when I pick her up uh, shortly, I'm going to ask her how it went and it's going to, it went fine. And then I'm going to say, I'm proud of you. Good job. Because this morning you were worried about it. And now that it's over, no problems. Everything was fine. And guess what? That's going to happen again. And you're going to be okay then too. Yep. And so now the wanna... train tracks are, 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 they're built there in her brain. Like those train tracks are there in her brain. There's a, and pull out this, this quote by Billie Jean King, the tennis player from the seventies and eighties. Pressure is a privilege. It's so important for kids to realize, like, if you're feeling that the, the little thing in your tummy, the butterflies, are, that's great. Like you, you have the opportunity to feel that pressure. That's such a great thing because people that go through their life and don't ever feel this, that, that feel that, they're not living their best life. They're not living their best self because they're not going through that feeling. It's such a cool opportunity to feel that feeling that you felt this morning. It means you care about it. That's what I've noticed. So yep. I'm, I'm a community actor here. And before going on stage, I get those feelings. And that's, for me, it's a, it's a, a signal that this is really important to me. And I, I want to do a good job. And that's good. That's yep. a good thing. Because if I felt nothing, then it wouldn't matter to me. And if I screwed up, who cares? Doesn't matter. Didn't care about it anyway. So um, we have to, we have to encourage and model that those feelings and emotions are good things. And we highlight those. And this has been a really super and uh, awesome conversation. 
I want to thank you for coming on. Is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners, uh, anything that you have coming up or if they want to find more about you or the building men program um, where they could find that? Thanks, dude. I appreciate it, Kevin. I love the conversation as well. Um, always cool to to chop it up with an lefted dude too. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I Building Men podcast comes out once every week and a half, two weeks or so. Uh, I've almost 200 episodes in the bank already. Congrats. Um, that's huge. Thank you, man. Appreciate yeah. that. And um, a lot of the, you'll know a lot of the people probably that you, that you have jumped on with as well. Um, I post on Instagram pretty frequently, building.men. My website is buildingmen.io. And that's where you can find out about work with me in the school capacity as an individual coach for young men, middle school and high school. And then I do a group called the foundation. That's an online group that I work with young men, middle school and high school every two weeks on um, Sunday afternoons. And we talk about this stuff and, uh, and I invite on guest mentors that we have conversations and invite the boys to ask questions of guys who are successful in some area of their life. They might be an author. They might be an entrepreneur, a former athlete, things like that. And so they're giving piece of advice, guys that have overcome and had to, you know, persevere through difficult challenges and situations. And, um, that's what I'm doing. And I'm, that's, it's my, my reason for being here on the planet is to help build strong young men. Very admirable. And thank you for your service. Thank you, my man. Appreciate it. All right. Good chatting with you. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you around. Take care, brother. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest episodes, be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.